Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. It's my great pleasure to reintroduce a friend <laughs> of the show, John Kalecki. Welcome, John. Hey, nice to be here again with you. I, I love you three. Okay, I just love you three. And you've been so nice to me and you're my friend and I appreciate that. Well, we love you. It's unanimous mm. and mutual, apparently. Um, we're here to celebrate your latest accomplishment, which involves a show at White River Junction in what you describe as a maker space. Um, but before we get to that, I'd like to um, recommend the audience once again, John's wonderful book, Because Art. Oh. Read it, buy it. I've just reread it. Um, it's really fabulous, full of all kinds of insight and it's very smart. And as I was going to say to John before we started taping, one thing I really love about interacting with you is that I always learn so much. Oh. And we'll get to that um, in a minute. But I'd also like to um, commend the audience, um, commend your latest podcast interview to the audience. Um, it occurs on TransCat. And um, could you tell us a little about TransCat, if you wouldn't mind? What also is striking is that you're everywhere. Your venues are so eclectic. I learn about new places and publications every time I see any of your work. Oh, well, well, well thank you. First of all, I want to shout out to all things uh, LGBTQ, because, you know, your program has gone on for a very long time, and it is one of the sole voices in our universe, in the media landscape. And to think about what's happening in our country right now, your show is going to be even more essential. So, you know, I, that you keep doing this these years is so amazing to me, and it is deeply appreciated. Okay. And TransCat is a, a, a new podcast platform by Claire McCarthy, who is a, a, has a really fascinating life story with a Latin teacher and transitioned and came out as transgendered. And she decided that, as you all did with, with, with your media, is to figure out, well, how do we build community? And we build it together. So she's, um, I was just on the 15th episode of her new podcast, TransCat, and she's um, sort of like you in that she does a lot of research. She's, she's an academic and then she asks a lot of fun questions and she's irreverent and funny. And, and um, the other speakers, many of them are uh, trans themselves. And I learned things uh, in the world. And I was just, it was a pleasure to be on talking to her. It was a lot of fun. Well, it was a great podcast and I learned many things and even took notes, as I said. Um, you always take notes. That, that's part of you. You're, you're a historian. Now, also, I want to say, okay, we can say this. We are queer elders, okay? <laughs> you and I and Linda are in Outwards, uh, the archive for queer elders, and there's interviews. So make sure your listeners go to Outwards and see the interviews with the two of you as well, because, you know, you have great stories. And you and Linda are on the calendar. Of course, I'm Mr. July, honey. I'm uh -oh. Mr. July. <laughs> She's April, I think. <laughs> and uh, my friend Carla is pictured with you um, and your month. So I, I, we're Disability Awareness Month in July, I'm told. So uh, I'm very proud to be with Carla. Mm -hmm. And Linda is reading in Burlington in her picture, but we digress. Um, <laughs> let's get to what's going on with you and... Uh, on February 1st, which will be after this uh, show airs, or before this show airs, uh, you're going to kick off Junction Arts and Media, and the um, website address is uviam, ujam.org, and we'll put that up. Um, 
they are sponsoring a month of radical love. What a fabulous idea. And you're going to be in it with uh, three of your intermediate installations, including flux, flow, and allergies. Um, flux, we're going to talk about at great length because it uh, will give us a window into an early art movement that many of us don't know about. Um, and it's so it, there's a little description of that. Uh, other works include a collaboration with choreographer Eiko Otaki. Uh, speaking, you're both speaking to your dead mothers, and I've seen that before. It's so moving. I, you know, every time I see it, it's it's mm, it's you. really um, heartbreaking. And I have some uh, quotations from you that I'll share apropos of that. You say. Art doesn't have to be beautiful. And then in an article about your colleague's work, you say, art is indeed where hope lives. So those are two uh, important things to think about as you watch that. Uh, and then you're also showing, or they're also showing an abstract work with tears, which is very provocative. Uh, the installation is going to be on display at Junction Arts and Media um, in White River Junction through February 28th and can be viewed between 9 and 5, Monday through Friday, and Saturday, February 11th, uh, after this interview appears, uh, between 7 and 8.30, JAM is going to host dr drinks and hors d'oeuvres reception with the artist who's right here with us. That would be me. <laughs> yes. uh -huh. Let's talk a little more in depth about your background, although everybody knows who you are and you've been a um, visible person on the cultural and political scene. Uh, before serving two terms as legislator in the Vermont House of Representatives, Kalecki worked as executive director, program officer, um, and curator for a broad range of arts organizations, including the Flynn Center in Burlington, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and the San Francisco Foundation. Kalecki's videos have been screened in festivals, galleries, museums, hospitals, and universities worldwide, and are in the collections of numerous libraries and universities. I'm also thrilled, this is, I'm quoting you, uh, I'm also, I'm so thrilled to share my recent work at JAM. Love having it in dialogue with other media makers in White River Junction. So let's pause and talk a little about the other, uh, this maker space that they've created and, you know, what. Well, it's, as you, as you, as your show is housed in Orca Media in Montpelier, Junction Arts and Media is the new uh, public access space they just moved into that new space and uh it's it's so it's an open space and they have worker stations for people to come in and make their work they also the, their staff is there they have a micro cinema they do performances it, it's right on um, main street south main street in um, white river junction i think next to the the pie the wonderful pie restaurant uh -huh. um, and so they put a call out for people to do installations and they said it was a month of radical love. And so I wrote them and uh, sent them these three videos. And I said, they're not quite radical love, but uh, you know, I'd love to have you look at them and it would be an honor to have them there in a space that other people are making work on their, on their computers too, because I thought it was fun. In particular, the piece you know, we'll talk about Flux is a piece about process and making work. So I thought, well, that's just perfect. And so, um, I'm going to have the echo piece talk, which is called Elegies that you referenced. It's a duet that we do talking to our mothers. It's been on Vermont PBS. It's, it's had a, a great run. That's going to be in a monitor. And then I have this abstract piece of tears running down uh, my chin, basically. And that is going to just be projected on the wall. And then the fluxus piece is gonna be on a workstation with the sculpture that I've made 
in, in the film, it's me making a, a piece about making a sculpture. And the sculpture is going to be there next to the video of me making the sculpture because I want it to be in a maker space in that way. So I thought it would be a lot of fun. And, you know, they said, yay. So it's, yeah, well, you know, because you're an artist and a writer. And it's so hard when you make something. And then you think. Uh-oh, you're frozen. What do I do with it? You know? And so when I make this, I'm back. Are, are you back? Okay, start at the beginning. It's so hard when you make something. Okay. You know, you're an artist and, and you know this. It, it is so hard when you make something. And after you've made it, you think, oh, what do I do with it now? How do I find a place in the world for it? Where does it belong? What does it mean? And it's a very fragile place for an artist after they make something to do something. So this is actually the premiere of this flux piece is uh, going to be in White River Junction. So that's why I was excited about it. And it's it's a it's a kind of an homage to the fluxus art movement in the early 60s. And that came right after happenings, you know, where people were doing wild, crazy things. And then this group of artists who were really in a, in a class with John Cage in, in the late 50s at the new school, we're talking about, hmm, what's, what, is there a distinction between art and life? And the art world has gotten so pretentious and maybe we just have to look at daily activities and, and drop all of this high art, low art kind of stuff. And so people like Yoko Ono, who it was very important in that time, she would just do idea pieces or she would just do these performance scores about the sky. Um, and uh, a composer, Lamont Young, did a great uh, score called um, Draw a Line and Follow It. Oh, and, that's where that comes from. I thought they yes. were on Cage's line. Um, and what's great about that is everyone could do whatever they wanted with it. And that's what Fluxus was about. They didn't want theaters. They didn't want galleries. They often did things in the street. Or sometimes they just did... Um, mail art and sent things back and forth. But the draw line and follow it was a kind of a wonderful thing that a lot of artists had fun with. Namjoon Pike uh, was in a gallery and dipped his tie in ink and then he dragged it across the line and that became his art. And many people have done that. So in this particular piece, I take the performance scores, not the actions, but the scores and interpret them in my own way. So at one point, you'll, you'll see in the video that I take a piece of chalk and I draw a line and I scratch it under the wood of the table. And that actually becomes the map of the next gestures I'm going to do. Now, no one's going to know that and no one has to know that. It's just like a deliberate action that has the intention is just the doing of it. And so for me, uh, I thought, well, you know, these people are really important to me. They're like the foundation of postmodernism and conceptual art. But what, what happened is, and they worked in the 60s, by the 70s, because they really weren't making too many objects, they, the museums couldn't collect them as much. So there's very little known about them. But many of them then transitioned and became very famous because they start making objects for museums. So I love this little sliver of art history that I feel has influenced so many people. And so this is my kind of homage to something that most viewers won't know anything about. And that's okay. That's what's fun for me. It's like, okay, some, someone watched it and they said, oh, it's like, it's like a Zen practice. And I thought, great. Okay. That's good. Yeah. I like that. And it is in a way, it's very deliberate and intentional. I have a friend who paints Zen Enzo's. Oh, yes. We talked to Jerry. I learned a lot from that interview, too. But in this film, you have 12 gestures with found objects that are references to past pieces. And each of those objects, um, the gestures relate back to the past pieces. I, I had so much fun. I, I, um, I wanted to only use stuff I found. So 
uh, I, I officiated at a wedding at a, a friends of mine on a, on a farm in Williston. And um, afterwards, we were all cleaning up everything. And, and there was this one old table that they were going to throw away. And they had they covered it up and it became the bride and groom's table. Um, and I said, don't throw it away. I'll use it for my film. So I grabbed the table uh, and a, a friend of mine had a violin. And I said, well, Influx is someone named June Bike smashed a violin. So do you have a violin that's kind of broken or because I don't want to smash something. But she said, oh, yeah, I have one that's cracked and has no strings. That's perfect. So it, in the piece, my homage is I take this violin, I polish it up a little bit, and then I play it as a percussive instrument because it doesn't have any strings. And that's sort of what I do with that. And it was fun finding all these things and thinking, okay, now, how, how can this become a, a collage of meaning by putting it together? And then you have cassette holders, which is your process art that you include in the piece. Can you talk a little about that? Yes, I really was thinking about, okay, so is there an end product or what is it that um, in, in the arc of this, uh, this video, what's a culminating moment? And um, you've been very generous at the top of the interview, you talked about my book. So that's been important to me. That's a compilation of 56 of my writing pieces. But the other two pieces are old cassettes of my AIDS trilogy pieces from the 90s videos I'd made and my disability uh, videos that I made in the 2000s. And I thought, well, that's sort of what my art has been, is both my video activism and my uh, author activism. And so I just made an abstract sculpture of a piece of wood that I found um, uh, and the farm as well. And we I just put plaster of Paris around it. And, and in a way, one doesn't have to know what those videos are about because it's, or the, even the book. But I thought, well, that is actually my art, the arc of my art. And, and so, so it has meaning somewhat. And this, uh, this is a real departure from your past videos which have been reliant on personal narratives is that right yes yes i i really felt like i wanted to um try something new you know this is my 17th film i i have some had some documentaries made of this our singer friend janicean mm -hmm. a beautiful hour-long documentary that's been shown all over the world for so that's been great and i also had a documentary about three couples dealing with disability but most, mo most of them have been the AIDS, agitprop works and the disability works have, have all been personal narratives about my life and the impact of the pandemic and disability. Uh, so I, I decided, I thought, well, let me try something different. You know, let me not do all narratives. The other piece in the show, Elegies, is a piece that I wrote to my mother and I shared that with Eiko Otake and so that is a personal narrative piece that we share with with that will be in this show as well so I, I that's why I thought it was it was nice to show that piece um and then to show this new direction or this next piece I don't know what directions are after 17 um and so and the, the water piece is a tiny little piece that I made in 2017. And I, I was gonna, I had an exhibition at Champlain College of a retrospective of my video works. And I wanted to have a new work in there, but that was all my AIDS work, my disability work. And I wanted to have like a, a just the short purification piece. Cause he's, uh, and I felt that that was like a blessing for people who would come to see this installation. Cause it was so dark and, and, the personal narratives were, you know, kind of sad, lamenting. So I thought, well, just this piece. So it's it's just a, a slow motion of this much of me, and it's just water coming down. And I showed it at Champlain College, and then it, I didn't feel like it had a life. You know, just that's what it was. But the Susan Calza Gallery in, Mon in Montpelier this, this summer had a call for artists' pieces under five minutes that they could show outdoors. 
So it was during the art walk and, and it's like, so I sent it to Susan uh, and she showed it and it was just, it was great to see it in, uh, there and in her gallery. So I thought, oh, maybe this has a, a piece. And I also felt it was a nice transition piece between the sadness of elegies about mm -hmm. the death of our mothers and this process piece um, of fluxus. And so just to have this little, um, I don't know, purification piece, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a great combination. Let's go back if we could to the three age related videos that some of us were privileged to see on December 1st. Um, and you told us, you told me before we taped a story about some of the audience for that. Do you feel comfortable sharing that with us, with us now? Sure, sure. The, the Susan Calza Gallery on December 1st um, from World AIDS Day uh, screened had, had a one night screening of my three AIDS videos. And I cried all through them, by the way. It was, they're so moving. Well, th thank you. Thank you. It was um, distracting. I was crying and sniffling. But and I, I made the, in, in the 90s when many of my friends were dying, many of my friends were sick. And it was a way for me to survive the grief, really, in you know, elegiac pieces. And they're about bodies and trying to make the body holy again because uh, our bodies have been demonized. Um, queer bodies have been demonized and sick bodies have been demonized and all of this. So it, it was important to me to kind of claim the body, reclaim the body. Um, and so they've, they've had around AIDS activist videos. They, they've been around the world. It was nice, but it was nice to see them again now, you know, uh, 30 years later uh, when they were screened on This World AIDS Day. And um, I was very touched. There was a, uh, a man who came and uh, he was sitting there quietly and I thanked him for coming and he told me he didn't get out much, but that he wanted to come because he didn't want to feel so alone. And I just felt so honored to be there because I also was made these films 30 years ago, not to feel alone. So, you know, when you were there, it was important because you're part of my community, but I knew you and I didn't know him. And I felt like maybe he was seen that, that evening. I hope so. That's a lovely story. I hope so too. Um, you have some memorable quotations and let me run some back to you in the time we have left. One fabulous thing you say in the interview uh, on Transcat is the fringe is where all the change happens in the world. Expatiate, if you would. Well, as a, as a curator at the Walker Art Center, a contemporary artist, I saw that artists from the fringe make a huge impact and some of them mainstream, but they change. And even the Fluxus period that we're talking about. Andy Warhol was not part of the Fluxus movement, but he had dinner with those people. And... A couple of years later, he was making Brillo boxes, paintings. Okay, so Andy Warhol was, he mainstreamed the Fluxus ideas. This is how art happens. In the legislature, it's the same thing. I learned that it was, I was much more comfortable and I felt it was important work for me to focus on the disenfranchised, those without homes, um, you know, and uh, working on affordable housing issues, um, working on issues of recovery and, and people with substance issues, and those were important. And it, what was great for me is I realized that those were the people that I was there to serve, you know, and by helping the fringes of our society, it heals mainstream society, just as in the art world. So I, I, I do believe that. And, you know, in a sickening way, you can look at the right wing in this country and the fringe of that. Look at the impact it's had on our, our world as well. And so it's this, these, the fringe things from all sides. I'm just used to one side. My, my left, this is my left hand, but that might look right, but I want it to be left. Um, I'm a little more comfortable on that side of things. But we see that that's 
that's where aesthetic and political revolutions begin on the fringes. Well said, John. Well, let me, as we draw to a close, let me encourage the audience to go to the Junction Arts and Media in White River Junction on from now uh, until later, but also especially on February 11th, where John is going to be there. So, and if people like Rocky Horror Picture Show after on the February 11th after my reception, they're having a screening of that, so you can dress up and be your fabulous self and come on down to White River Junction. And between five and seven, there's going to be a dance party. On the fifth. Oh, on the fifth. Y yes, I think so. It's, uh, let me see. See, I have a, um, from it, five to seven, a first Friday dance party from five to seven, followed by Valley Improv and a shadow cast production of the Rocky Horror Picture. I don't know. Well, anyway, go to, <laughs> go to the uh, uvjam.org and get more information. All right. Well, you, we'll put up the link, I'm sure. And, you know, I thank you for this. And, uh, you know, I really want to urge your viewers to also see your interview in Outwards Archive. It's terrific. Well, thank you. For this episode of All Things LGBTQ, the interview show, we have welcomed back an old friend. And we're going to talk about the legislature and priorities and that rainbow caucus that we may have heard about. So please welcome back Representative Emma Mulvaney Stanick from Chittenton 17, the old North End. Old North End and New North End. I'm oh, actually really? a hybrid district. Yeah, it's almost split 50-50 when you look at the voter file. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Emma, you, as I keep telling people, you grew up with activist politics, mm -hmm. involved in the progressive movement and nonprofits and initiatives and serving on the Burlington City Council being the chair of the state progressive party, and now you're a second term legislature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's start by talking a bit about the Rainbow Caucus, because you were one of the legislators who were involved in the creation of the caucus. Who is involved in it? And what were you seeing as being the voice that the caucus could provide that the legislature might not have been hearing. Great. Yeah, so um, thanks for having me on your show, of course. Um, Keith, it's always a delight. And I think what, I think the piece I'll start with with the Rainbow Caucus is there's always been, as we know, with queer people and the history of people, there's always been queer people. But in terms of people feeling safe enough to be out, especially in an elected body like the Vermont legislature, um, it's only been in the last um, couple of, of terms that we have had an out Rainbow Caucus, which for now are any member of the of the House or Senate who is LGBTQIA plus identified um, member of the of either body. So we had about 14 members last biennium and we went up one. 15 for this biennium. Of course, we also have uh, State Treasurer Mike Pichek on the constitutional statewide level, which is so exciting. First queer person in that statewide role. Um, so we're very excited. We had a few retirees, including, um, as most po folks probably know in Vermont, Representative Bill Lippert, who for a long time was the only out member of the House of Representatives. And so he has retired from the um, uh, House of Representatives. And then, of course, the other very famous member that has stepped down for bigger, brighter, Rainbow Futures is Senator, now Congresswoman, uh, Becca Ballant, who's now headed to Washington, D.C. And just had that great thing on social media that she said something like a proud, small, fierce dyke or something like that. So she's off doing other amazing things uh, scrappy, down in D.C. Scrappy, scrappy little dyke. That is such a great correction because I knew yeah. I didn't have it quite right. Totally. Yes. I'm going to get the t-shirt. Anyway, so we are 14 members strong. We have this biennium. We have two members in the Senate and the other 13 are in the House this session for the Rainbow Caucus. And to your question about like, what's the what's the purpose of this caucus? Um, it really has, there are many issue-based caucuses in the legislature, but there are not there are not any, I think, that are based on one's identity. And this became, um, it started really as just a networking, connecting um, kind of space, but over the, the first two years since I've been a member, it really became a space for um, coordinating a leadership voice 
for folks who are queer identified on a public, more public and wider platform to speak up when issues of harm in particular, sadly, have happened to our community. So things ranging from the murder of Fern um, Feathers uh, about a year or so ago, um, to just offering statements of solidarity to schools where there's been acts of hate against um, young queers in the schools, um, and really just trying to make sure that that local local communities and especially local queer folks see we see them and we stand in solidarity with them and we make a statement often when the media is somewhat silent or frankly gets it wrong um and so with uh unfortunately with the murder of fern feathers our caucus really stepped forward to really push media to get pronouns correct to get names correct to make sure that they were really um reflecting who fern was as a person rather than the default to dead naming, that was a complicated case, of course, but just really making sure that we are adding that extra level of accountability and um, uh, visibility for our community. So knowing that we have lived into time and when you and I get together, we could talk for hours, looking at some of the issues that the Rainbow Caucus might be talking about, certainly, the resignation last week of Representative Kate Donnelly. It, it has to be in the forefront. And Kate raised a number of issues that, you know, we say we're proud to be a citizen legislature, but then we make it impossible for citizens to truly serve. So are, are there any conversations or any thoughts about how the House in particular might respond to Kate's resignation. Mm -hmm. Well, the, there's two important points with Representative Kate Donnelly's resignation, which just happened last week. So she was a member of our Rainbow Caucus, um, represents a portion of Lamoille County. I'm sure the first out queer person to represent that district. I'm, that's a pretty you know, easy assumption in most places of Vermont, sadly, still today. Um, but there were two major pieces of why she decided she could no longer do this work. And one was structurally how the legislative system is set up in Vermont, the citizen legislature that's part-time, that makes wild assumptions around what um, these jobs should be compensated at, and yet haven't been updated to really reflect how complex policymaking is today. Um, and also how challenging it is to be have a legislative body that only meets five months out of the year when our executive branch, the administration, is full year working and implementing or not policies that we pass in, in the spring, and then we don't get back into session again until January. So the checks and balances even on very important policy is often lagged. There's a lag time in what we're able to do. Um, so, But as an individual, when you serve in this body, it's extremely difficult because it pays $13,000 a year, $13,000 for a job that is year round, uh, to, be, to be honest, because it's not like constituents stop contacting you after May when we adjourn, or um, that you only start working on a bill or an issue in January when the session begins. The I have found the bulk of policy development work, researching, working with interns, figuring out what other states are doing, monitoring the press, monitoring Vermont, listening to constituents, all these different ways we get policy ideas and bill ideas. All that actually primarily happens May to December, and yet nothing is compensated during that period of time. Um, so I actually have was working on a bill last biennium. I've improved upon that bill this session, and I actually want to call it, if I could name bills, the Kate Donnelly bill to, in her in her in her spirit, in her honor, really, um, because it addresses a few of these key areas. And it's actually a bill I really worked hard to look at with an equity equity lens. So it's not just compensation. So for folks who are self employed, Kate is self employed, for example. I'm self employed, for example. Um, unless we had partners with access to health insurance, there's no health insurance access for legislators. So I should back up. I'm going to increase the salary. I think that was probably a given. I'm going to definitely increase the salary. Um, going to um, make sure the state offers health insurance to all legislators who need it. This is an accessibility issue for working people, for single people, um, from folks who have crappy insurance wherever they might work to be able to access the state plan. Um, a third area is to look at our reimbursement system. So currently the reimbursements we receive are related to housing, mileage, and, and food. And if you have the economic privilege to live in Montpelier during the week, you actually make more money at the end of that cycle with reimbursements, $135, $40 a night, other than uh, versus people who have small children like Kate and I do, who have to commute back and forth um, to our homes to care for small children. I actually lose money. I don't know about Kate's story, but I lose out money because I have to pay for a babysitter on top of my very low salary and my mileage doesn't cut it to cover my car and gas. 
I have to pay for a babysitter. I can get back to Burlington every day. And I can't access the housing reimbursement because I don't spend the night down in Montpelier versus other people who are spending every night in Montpelier. So it's a completely backward system and it's and it's it's outdated. It's just completely outdated and needs to be thrown out, in my opinion. Um, the other couple quick things in that bill include making sure that folks with um, physical limitations are able to get parking reimbursements. Now they can't, they have to pay for parking. It's like such an insult if they spend the night at the Capitol Plaza or elsewhere and they get charged for parking. They have to pay for their own parking. That's not a reimbursement through the state legislative system. So there's a number of items in this bill. I'm, I'm, it's going to probably be introduced later this week, and I really hope it pushes us forward. I will say there's another bill in the Senate, but I find it actually quite short-sighted because it calls for us to do a yet another study on this. And we have studied this, I think, at least two or three times over the last 30 years in Vermont. We have more than enough information. And if anything, it will delay there becoming more an equitable approach for legislators if we kick it down the road through another study and wait another whole biennium to try to address this issue. The other important thing I just want to mention, Keith, though, because Kate resigned for two big reasons. One is the structural system, but the other is being a queer legislator in the state of Vermont in these political times in this country is really difficult. And she and many of other folks in the Rainbow Caucus have been targeted on social media and in our communities for taking a public stance on things like gender affirming care for minors or gender affirming care period um, and other issues that transphobic people are um, challenging. And just, it's it's a vulnerable space to be put out there for. So um, I, I wish that was not the reality because everyone should be seen and validated for who they are and should be valued in the, in the system of representative democracy. And yet it's not safe. We don't, we, don't, we have limitations because of people's free speech, but people can still be um, mean and send attacks. And unless they literally make a physical threat to us, we have to sort of take it on the chin as, as public elected officials. And that's not right either. And yet I just want to name that because that's another very challenging environment to be an elected leader, especially with a minoritized identity like being queer. There are so many things that I would love to follow up on, but I know we're not going to have time. Very quickly, I didn't hear you mention child care as being a portion of what you were looking at. And then also, could you talk a bit about the bill that is currently before House Judiciary that would provide some protections around people coming to Vermont for reproductive liberty and gender affirmation care? Absolutely. You read my mind on that second part. And I'm appalled. I'm clutching my non-existent pearls. I can't believe I didn't talk about the child care reimbursement. That is a huge part of my bill. And actually, it's more inclusive than that. It's dependent care because there are legislators in the future or in the past who also have folks who are dependent on them for their care. And again, same logic. If we're off legislating, we need to be able to, to not be losing money. Um, by being able to support the people who depend on this when we're off in Montpelier legislating, be it children or you know aging parents, et cetera. So that is a huge part. That actually what was one of the pieces I struggle with the most in the bill to try to figure out what is a fair number to put in, what's a real number, I should say, a realistic number on what people are paying right now for dependent care, uh, for after school care, for you know toddler infant care in the state. So yes, that's definitely a piece. So yeah, let's talk about let's talk about the shield law. So um, or shield bill, hopefully to be a law soon. So um, that bill is moving through House Judiciary. I actually don't have the bill number right in front of me. Do you know the bill number? H eighty nine. H-89, this is why I have you here, Keith. Yeah, H-89, um, a lot of bills have been being introduced in the last week or two, but this bill, pretty much as soon as it was introduced, went right into committee in House Judiciary. And most folks will probably know because of the Dobbs decision by the Supreme Court, there's a large call among many states that want to continue to protect abortion and reproductive health care um, to create some level of shield laws for reproductive health care, specifically abortion. But here in Vermont, we took that a step further. And in H89, it's a two-part um, policy where, number one, it protects providers and patients uh, who are seeking abortion and uh, care, but it also protects patients and providers who are, prov who are seeking or providing uh, gender affirming care, health care. So that um, is not something we've seen in many other states who are just trying to tackle abortion. And we're proud about that here in Vermont. Um, it's It's been interesting. We haven't seen a lot of opposition to it yet. Um, but at the same time, I think it's it's really, as we say, like a very ripe piece of policy to make sure that we're showing up. If we're going to open up the legal protections for providers and patients, we need to always look for 
folks who are, you know, push the margins of our society and seek out what their support is needed for healthcare. And of course, that's queer folks, especially gender, people seeking gender affirming care here in Vermont. So there's, they're working through all the details about um, the limitations. There's media out on it now about limitations of how much can we protect folks. And a lot of it includes like physically where people are. So if you get the either type of those care um, here in Vermont, you are protected here in Vermont and Vermont will not participate in any legal action that your home state like Texas or something tries to invoke on you if you had your care here in Vermont. It also protects the provider here in Vermont who provided that care for you. Um, it gets a little harder when folks get back to their home states um, to have additional protections carry on from there, but at least Vermont itself as a state will not will not participate in um, any legal action. And I know our attorney general, our new attorney general, Charity Clark, is 100% behind this as well. So it's great to make sure that all aspects of our government in this state, at least, is really working hand in hand to further protect people's fundamental rights. And there were 100 sponsors who signed on to the bill, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. And in committee, they're talking about looking at data protection in a broader sense, mm -hmm. because there were some questions that came up. But in our remaining time, I know that one of the priorities for you and for the members of the legislature is about paid family leave. Mm -hmm. So, And I know that there is a proposal that's, that the Scott administration has put forward, which would be a voluntary process but you all are talking about something more comprehensive and more robust. Could you share a little bit about what you're looking at? Absolutely. Well, paid family leave is one of the reasons I ran for office two years ago um, and continue to run again. So the legislature got close to passing paid family leave about three-ish years ago before the pandemic. Um, but even then, I think it what didn't go far enough. It didn't. It did not create a system where um, families, all types of families, can really buy into a system and benefit from a, pay, uh, a paid leave system. So the governor, right before the legislature began, back to that my point earlier, things happen when we're not in session, and it's really hard to respond in an adequate way when we're not actually convened. So he proposed a voluntary paid family leave system, which I believe New Hampshire and maybe a couple other states have explored, and it phases in in a voluntary manner paid family leave for state workers in year one, for employers in year two who want to participate, not required, and then in year three, self-employed people who want, not required, to participate. Now, the problem with a voluntary system is that it is um, it, it, doesn't, it does not uh, generate enough resources to really adequately support everyone who could really access and benefit from paid family leave. And what about if you are working at McDonald's or working at Walmart, I will pick on these low-wage you know, retailers, right, who who frankly make a lot of profit off the back of some workers, and we all know that, so I will forever criticize them. Um, so, you know, what if they don't participate? Many of those folks did not participate in the voluntary COVID relief money that we were moving, trying to get to frontline workers during the height of the pandemic. So what do we, what in what way do we think that they're going to voluntarily sign up to contribute into a paid family lease system? It's a, it's a very, um, half-baked policy that frankly shows that, that the governor does not have interest in making a universal um, and progressive system. So we need everyone in, because frankly, everyone at some point in their life benefits from having access to paid family leave, be it if you have a child or you have a sick relative um, or you're sick yourself or you have an aging parent, this is, these are many moments when people can access that program. So the, 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 the bill that's moving through that also got over 100 co-sponsors, at least in the House, um, is a full-fledged system. It would um, involve a payroll tax. It would involve, as I understand it, a payroll tax um, as introduced, and it would also make sure it was accessible to everyone, including those who are self-employed, um, including folks who are, we require every employer. So it didn't matter if you worked for Walmart or you worked for the most progressive employer in the state, you would have access to it. And the most important thing, Keith, is we would get off this completely inequitable and harsh system that often mostly impacts female identified folks, right? Where you have to suck it up and figure out some magical math to figure out how to you know, care for your aging parent while still working full time, or go back to work too early after having a child. Um, and it's 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 one of these many layers that that continues to suppress the earning power and frankly, just the well-being of female identified folks in our economy. And this is an incredibly important piece. And I look, I hope with a hundred co-sponsors, this will start to really move and we'll have a more meaningful policy soon. And if I understand what the budget people put forward, even though it's a payroll tax. People shouldn't 
know, shudder that the amount that you're actually contributing is actually a fairly small amount and it is not going to adversely impact those people who are earning lower wages. You know, you're not going to be paying a large portion of your salary so that you have this future care. So with that, I need to say thank you for spending this time with us. What? Now, that was it? <laughs> I, I know. Well, this is what I said when you and I get together. But I'm, I'm putting out there now that in a month or so, I'm going to be inviting you back because we didn't talk about affordable housing. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't talk about what's the work that you're doing in your committee. Mm-hmm. You know, are there other issues that the Progressive Caucus, where, you know, you are the, you're the head mm-hmm. of the Progressive Caucus in the House, are there other initiatives that you are supporting and you believe that the legislature should be looking at? And, and then I'll give you a chance also to take a bigger pot shot at the administration. <laughs> Well, I'm here for it. And so I would love to come back and talk more about the Progressive Caucus priorities or other bills. And maybe I should bring one of the new four new members of the Rainbow Caucus with me next time, but I would love to come back. We, we can absolutely do that. And with that, thank you Great. so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.